Hello, I'm Julie Jones, Planning Manager for the City of Fridley. I am not in Fridley today. I am on the grounds of the State Capitol because while spring is a busy time for development to start occurring in Fridley, it's also the time of year where some of us on staff in the Community Development Department are taking a look at legislation that's going through that may be something that's going to cause us to have to change our city codes or something that's going to affect the budgetary process for both the city and as for you as a taxpayer. And it's always been a mystery to me just how this legislation starts in the, in the beginnings and goes through hearings and becomes law. So I thought it'd be interesting to meet up with some people at the state capitol that understand this process. So that's what I'm doing today. It's a crazy busy day here today because it's the last day um, for things to go through hearing. Um, but we've got some interviews set up, so hopefully everything will work out and we'll give you a, a look into the legislative process at the state capitol. So come along for, for a tour of that here today. Well, I'm inside the House Chambers um, with Paul Hicks from the Chief Clerk's Office for the House. Um, I understand there's a, a Chief Clerk's Office on the House level, and then there's a, a Senate uh, that's, office as well. For that's the correct. That's, uh, in the Senate, it's called the Secretary of the Senate. Okay. And it seems like your office is kind of the hub of the activity. I mean, like at the city level, we have a city clerk that monitors legislative changes that we're making on the city level. So here at the state capitol, there is... Uh, your office that's kind of regulating and watching the legislation as it's going through the process. That's right. We're kind of like, a lot of people would say, like a lot like a city clerk, we're the main administrative arm of the of the house. So um, uh, our mission here as, as being part of the chief clerk's office is to do a couple of things. One, we help the members with parliamentary procedure, make sure that the bills mm -hmm. that they pass are within our state constitution and uh, within the house rules that they've adopted for legislation. We, we also have a main mission that uh, we provide information to the public. So we have copies of bills, copies of votes mm -hmm. that the members take. Mm -hmm. um, we, we provide all the schedules and the calendars that uh, so we know when a bill might be coming up on the floor mm -hmm. and calendar it a day. And we can mm -hmm. talk about that in a little bit. Yeah. And we also produce something that's very important. If you go to our Minnesota State Constitution, they talk about that the rolls, must, the, the votes must be taken and recorded. And we produce what's called the Journal of the House. The Journal of the mm -hmm. House is the official proceedings, much like a city council okay. would have their minutes and, right. the, and the clerk would right. uh, record those minutes and record those votes. Mm -hmm. We do the same thing, and, but it's okay. called the Journal of the House and in the Senate, they would have the Journal of the Senate where amendments are offered. It's the official proceedings of the House. What is con the business being conducted in the House and it's being okay. recorded and it must be done in a clear, biased, unbiased manner. So we're a nonpartisan office and that is our that is our charge right. to be concise, to be unbiased, and to record the official proceedings of the okay. House. And keeping track of this can be no easy task. I understand there are thousands of bills going That's through right. this session. This year so far in the uh, 2018 legislative 2017, 2018 biennium, mm -hmm. uh, we have over four thousand two hundred bills introduced. And so there's a lot of pieces of legislation um, uh, in the sort of committees and uh, being considered. It's just, just mind-boggling to me because it's a big undertaking that maybe we would do five to ten <laughs> amendments to exactly. our, our to zoning code ordinance. in a year. Yeah, yeah right. exactly. Um, so trying to kind of educate people in the process from beginning to end. So how does the process for a bill to be created even start? at okay. the beginning. Okay. Well, we're going to go real back to basics and we have to look to our state constitution. And mm -hmm. our state constitution says that we have to give a bill three readings, three okay. announcements, so to speak. Okay. So three readings on three separate days. And that was meant to say, you know what, you can't pass legislation too fast. Mm -hmm. Slow mm -hmm. down. This mm -hmm. is law that you're making that affects 
you know, five million Minnesotans, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So how does it get started? Well, if you're a legislator, Julie, and you want to introduce a bill, you would probably go to our revisor's office, which is there's attorneys there and staff, and they would help you draft a law. So maybe mm -hmm. a resident of your district might come to you and say, you know, I have a great idea. In fact, a lot of laws start this way. Mm -hmm. I have a great idea for a new mm -hmm. law. And you thought, oh, I think that is a great idea. You would take that idea to the revisor's office and you would have it drafted uh, by attorneys to say, okay, this is what it would look like in Minnesota statutes uh, if it would ever become law. Okay. So you would get that language drafted, you would take that copy and you would put it in what's called the hopper. Okay. It's over in the speaker's office. and. Uh, before session, the bills that are in the hopper would come to us in the chief clerk's office, and then we would assign it a, 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 a house file number. So, mm -hmm. and like I said, right now we're up to 4,200 bills. So mm -hmm. maybe this is 4,201 okay. bill, house file 4201. Okay. So you're doing that after the speakers of that's right um, after they've been submitted to the speaker. Okay. And um, they would then uh, be given to us. We give it the house okay. file number and then there would be a signed committee when they were sent to the speaker's mm -hmm. office. They were given a, what committee? So if your bill mm -hmm. deal with, for example, taxes, mm -hmm. then the speaker's office would say, okay, send this bill to the tax committee. Okay. It would be written down. And so on the first day that your bill, 4201, let's say, was going to mm -hmm. get introduced, mm -hmm. it, would, it would be on the introduction list and say, Representative Julie introduces House File 4201 okay. going to the committee on taxes. And we give it its first reading. Okay. And that bill then would be sent to committee. Okay, so it gets its first reading here it gets in its the first House Chambers, here. That's right. and then goes on to committee. And, and then they, we process and we bills send that original. I've, bills I've seen seem to go through two, three committees before they- They certainly can. It depends mm -hmm. on subject matter. Okay. So if your bill uh, dealt with taxes, but also dealt with a little bit of local government, mm -hmm. it would have to go to local government as well. Okay. So it depends on the subject matter of the bill. They can go to one committee. They don't have to go to more than one committee if it's okay. only one subject matter. Okay. But if it touches different areas of law, of different jurisdiction and the okay. different committees, then it has to go to the different okay. committees for, for advice. Okay. So your bill then goes to the committee and the tax committee. They, they could look at your bill and they say, you know, that's a great idea, uh, Representative Julie. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you what, we think we ought to amend it by changing this support. They can amend the bill. They can change it in committee. Okay. But ultimately what would happen then, if they liked your bill, they would pass it out of committee and send it back to the House floor. Okay. They come back in possession of the chief clerk's office, and and we're all done. Let's say, then we would put the bill in what's called the reports of the standing committees. The committee of taxes reports that House File 4201 is recommended to pass and go to the general register. Okay. And that's when we give the bill its second reading. This would probably be like maybe who knows a month ago you might have introduced this mm -hmm. bill. Now mm -hmm. it's finally it's three separate days. So now that was right. a month ago you introduced the bill. A month has gone by. You've got your bill out of committee. It okay. comes to the floor. We give it its second reading. Okay. And at that time, that's when the bill will go on what's on a calendar called the general register. The general register is a list of bills that have done with the committee process. They've gone through the committee process, and they're awaiting action on the house floor. Now, what would take a bill that's on the general register and get it for up for final debate? Right. right. That's my next question. That, <laughs> yeah, I anticipated that question. Uh, what would happen is that the rules committee meets, and the rules committee would designate certain bills off the general register, and designate them in what's called calendar for the day. And those okay. are the bills that are designated for their final debate. And okay. so the rules committee will take will take a look at your bill, House File Forty Two Hundred One, says, "Okay, let's going to have let's going to have that." Uh, debate. We'll put put that bill on the calendar for next Thursday, April fifth. Okay. And they can designate that for the calendar for the day. To be back here in front of the house. To be back Chambers. here in front Chambers of the house. Again. Okay. Right. And then everybody's aware of it. There's there's uh, rules in which they have to follow house rules when it has to be uh, announced. Okay. So people know that the bill's coming up. I was going to say, is there a certain, because I know in, in the city level where there's a certain number of days we have to announce a hearing, so do they, do the other legislators get a certain number of days to review that then before they have to vote on That's it? Correct. That's okay. correct. That's correct. So they're, and within House rules, uh, they have to designate it uh, two days in advance at okay. least, okay? okay? And then they're given a period of time, and I won't get too technical, but there's a period of time which they can offer amendments and pre-file amendments to okay. offer to the bill. Okay. And so they all have a time period within the House rules to be able to do that. Okay. So now it's next Thursday, your bill's up before the House, mm -hmm. you'll get up and 
talk about your bill okay. and uh, say what a great bill it is, mm -hmm. right? Some people may offer amendments to that bill on that day. Okay. Uh, but finally, when we're done discussing it, we're done amending it, it may get amended, who knows, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when we're done and you give a final argument, we'll have its third reading, the third and final reading as uh, required by our Constitution. That same day then? That, that same day, here, okay. that's right. Okay. And then we would vote for it in the House of Representatives. And if your bill passes, we'll send it over to the Senate. Okay. And then that's when that's things can get interesting too. When, yeah. when the Senate bill and the House bill don't quite match, we kind of hear about that in the news. And, exactly. and what happens then when they don't match exactly. up? Exactly, very good. So let's say the House file 4201 is over in the Senate. They pass the Senate. Now, two things could happen. The bill could come back over here, and they could they might not have amended it. They might have liked your language in the House mm. language. If, in that case, we would prepare that bill. If it passed the Senate unamended, it passed the same way it would pass the House, we would take that bill and get it ready for enrollment and presentation to the governor. We would take it to the revisor's office for final enrollment. Okay. Because we agree with the same language, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You might get a, a different version of 4201 coming back here, and you might agree with that language, mm -hmm. but we don't have the same language that the Senate passed, right? Mm -hmm. So you're going to ask the House to concur with the Senate amendments. Okay, so that to get kind of another vote to That's do that. That's right, okay. and so we have to give the bill another third reading, okay, mm -hmm. and uh, re-vote on third reading, and we, we're saying, yes, we're going to pass 4201, and we agree with the Senate amendments. Now, that way, that when we're sending that bill forward to the governor, we both, both bodies agree with the same language, which okay. is important. Right. The, the other option is this, 42, House File 42 comes back from the Senate and you don't like that language. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. terrible. What was the Senate thinking, right? And you do not like this language. Mm -hmm. Well, then you will ask the body that you want to send this bill to conference committee. Right. The conference committee is set up uh, to iron out differences between the House and the Senate position. Mm -hmm. uh, the Speaker will, you, you'll make that motion, that motion would pass, and the Speaker would have been asked then, to appoint three or five members uh, to serve on the conference committee. And okay. generally, the chief author of the bill serves as the chair of the okay. conference committee. Okay. So you would be the, and he, okay. he would probably appoint two other members or okay. f uh, four other members to serve yeah. on the conference committee with you. The Senate would do the same thing, same procedural thing. They would okay. appoint a conference committee and you would meet to iron out the differences. Okay. Once you iron out the differences and you agree again to the same exact language, that bill will come back to the House under okay. conference committee reports. Okay. Okay? And you will stand up and say, these are the differences we had with the Senate. This is what we agreed to. I'm asking that we adopt this conference committee report. Mm -hmm. We would have that debate. Mm -hmm. You cannot demand a conference committee report once it's on the floor. Okay. It's either an up or down vote okay. of what you decided in okay. conference committee. Right. And the House would give it another third reading. Okay. Okay? And final passage. If we pass it, we would send it over to the Senate. The Senate agrees with that language. Okay. Now we both agreed with the same language, and we get the, the bill would come back because it's a House file back to the House. We would literally take it and take it to the revisor's office for final enrollment and presentation to the governor for his signature. Okay. This whole process sounds absolutely exhausting. And just think of doing <laughs> it, can it be, but it's on very thousands interesting. of bills in such a short period of time yes. is just yeah. mind boggling. But it, it really is. But yeah. uh, you know, this is a very exciting place to work. Um, and uh, when you watch the legislature in action, I am always impressed by the the, the uh, dedication of everyone who serves here. You know, they really want to do a good job for the people mm -hmm. of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. They work hard at it, mm -hmm. uh, members and staff, mm -hmm. and it's really, uh, it's really quite something mm -hmm. to watch in action. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it is. Yeah. Well, thank you, Paul. It was just a very interesting summary of the, the whole process, and I feel like I understand it a little bit more now. Yeah. Well, so. great. And when uh, any of your viewers, please come down to the Capitol and visit us. It's and fun it's, to watch them in session as well. It is, and it's so beautiful down here after the renovation. It's excited to, exciting it really to is, see it. Really it. So, so, well, thank you so much thank you. for Appreciate being it. here today. Thank you for very this. much. Your lawn isn't just a piece of grass, it's an important part of Fridley's urban ecosystem. The plants that you plant and the way that you fertilize and water your lawn can make a huge difference to our environment. Here are our top three lawn care tips for spring and summer 2018. One, mow high. Keeping your grass between three and five inches produces healthier, denser grass that is better at trapping pollutants. Two, water wisely. 
Early morning is the best time to water your lawn. Make sure that your sprinklers are directed away from hard surface so that you aren't paying for water that you don't need. And three, keep the drains clear. Water that enters our storm drains drains into our water bodies, such as the Mississippi River, Moore Lake, and Rice Creek. Keep storm drains clear of pet waste and leaves. If you wouldn't want to swim in it, don't let it go down the drain. Well, we've heard a little bit about the process of a bill becoming law. I also wanted to talk with someone from the League of Minnesota Cities that represents the city on legal matters. And so with me is Gary Carlson, who's the Assistant Director of Communications with the League of Minnesota Cities. Thank you so much for making time for me. I know this is a crazy busy day here at the Capitol, but uh, really appreciate your time. Well, thank you for inviting me to be on your show. You know, um, Paul from the clerk's office did a really good job of explaining kind of the process that, that uh, bills go through. Um, where I know we get involved with the league is we're counting on the League of Minnesota Cities to watch these bills going through. We don't have time in our daily activity or job to be watching all these bills. Um, and so the league does a really good job of creating a newsletter that tells us some topics. And I know there's a couple of bills this time around that we're, we're watching. So. Um, I assume you have some role in, in what goes into that newsletter that alerts us to things that may be of interest to the city. Right. Well, the League is, tries to be the eyes and ears of what's going on at the Capitol for our city officials across the state. Uh, you know, every year or every biennium there are more than 4,000 bills introduced in the House and Senate and that takes a lot of time to read through all those bills, try to decide how many have an impact on cities and then try to get impact uh, analysis from our members to, to tell us how important those bills are. So we spend a lot of time reading and going through those bills, trying to get our reaction from our city officials, and then we try to relay the information we receive from our cities to legislators so they can make a better informed decision on what they're, uh, what they're considering. Oh, interesting. So you're not just alerting the cities through your newsletter. You're also working with the legislators to let them know what's going on, too. Frequently, legislators will call us and ask us for information about a, po a possible amendment or a bill draft they're thinking about, wanting to know exactly how that bill might impact the broad community of cities. And then we will go back and try to get an impact analysis from our members so we can share that with legislators and hopefully have them make a better decision. Um, cities are creatures of the state and so the legislature defines many of the rules that mm -hmm. govern how we function mm -hmm. and uh, of those 4,000 bills that are introduced this biennium I would say easily 50 to 60 percent of those bills have some impact on a city's operations. Wow. So uh, it takes a lot of time to comb through those bills and understand their impacts and our city officials are great in helping us respond and giving good advice to the legislature. Mm -hmm. Now you have me worried because I only have been watching a couple and when you say about 50% of 4,000, I'm worried that there's maybe others I should be watching too. But. Well, I, I pay particular attention to tax committee issues. I spend a lot of time in the tax committee on state aid issues, on property taxation issues, local sales tax issues. Uh, but we get involved in environmental issues, in land use, in uh, uh, the data practice law, the open meeting law. Uh, uh, basically election law, uh, you name it, uh, it has some impact on city operations. So we watch all those very closely um, and this is a time of year that you're here right now that many many bills are going through the process. And I think if you look at the agendas today there are on some agendas 20 or 25 bills that are wow. going to be considered and so we spend our evenings reading those bills and reacting uh, in committee hearings via testimony or we sometimes write letters to legislators if it's a long oh, okay. com complicated issue. So uh, unfortunately the legislative process does take people to be here full time to really understand all of the nuance of hmm. legislation. Wow. So I mean for example a couple, to give people an idea I mean there was uh, legislation last year and last session in relation to telecommunications that it impacted the city and then we had to change our, we had just changed our telecommunications code. We were kind of a, a kidding, trying to get above, you know, beyond the curve of knowing this small cell technology was coming and then the state passed legislation that changed definitions of things so then we had to go ahead and change our code again right. because we always want our city code to match the language and state statutes. And, he, and now again this year we see there's another small cell um, right. piece of legislation coming through and we're like oh no we're gonna have to change our code again but 
Well, and those, those bills were introduced on behalf of the wireless industry, mm -hmm. and they see issues that they want to have remedied in state statute, and we have to make sure that their remedies don't negatively impact our cities. Unfortunately, we can't control the entirety of the debate at the Capitol. We spend a lot of time trying to moderate bills, make them work for our cities as best we can. Uh, and in the case of the small cell wireless issue, that's an evolving technology mm -hmm. and a whole new area of state law that had to be considered. And uh, now the wireless industry is back again, wanting to mm -hmm. modify what was just passed mm -hmm. last year. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a, a process of compromise in the mm -hmm. legislative process. And uh, you know, advocates for changes in law really have the burden of proving why the law should be changed. And uh, we have the responsibility to be here on behalf of our cities to make sure that the law changes are uh, administratively, uh, uh, that we can comply with those new administrative mm -hmm. requirements. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what scares us about this one is, according to our public works director, it's going to decrease about by half what we can uh, accumulate from leasing fees, and it's it's a complicated issue, and and uh, don't want to go into that, but it's that reason why we're looking at these things closely because if that's going to impact the cost to the city, of yep. course, we have to adjust then our budget for next year to try well, to accommodate for that. And clearly, that particular bill that you're referring to, we want to make sure that taxpayers aren't subsidizing the wireless right. industry. Right. Uh, we want to make sure that the costs that, that, uh, of their antenna, of their facilities, mm -hmm. are paid for by the wireless industry and not paid for by the taxpayers of the state of Minnesota. So right. that's really what we're trying to do is preserve and protect uh, the ability of the taxpayer to respond right. to the industry needs to try to change the law. Right. That's exactly why we, we watch it at the city right. level for the same reason. Yeah, another uh, piece of legislation that we've been watching is uh, about organized garbage collection, which seems to get tweaked all the time, too. Another right. one that's driven, I'm sure, by the industry um, itself. Um, and uh, we have to react to that sometimes and then change our city code to, right. to match that. Yeah, and the organized collection issue has been a perennial issue at the state capitol. Mm -hmm. uh, I know the, the, the waste haulers always have an interest in maintaining their service territory areas. Uh, many of our cities are discussing the idea of organized collection, which basically is trying to make more efficient the collection of waste. Uh, not having numerous trucks go through a city uh, on the same day or having people have their garbage cans out every day of the week. Mm -hmm. uh, my particular city, I live in St. Louis Park, and we've had organized collection mm -hmm. for many, many years. And everybody has their, their waste can out on Monday morning, and they're all gone by Monday mm -hmm. afternoon. And um, the, we have one truck that comes through in the morning to pick up the garbage, and one truck that comes through on the recyclables, mm -hmm. and that's it for the week. Mm -hmm. And it's worked very successfully in my city, and I know other cities are looking at that model as a way to reduce traffic, reduce noise, reduce congestion, and make more efficient the operation of their waste mm -hmm. haulers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know other cities have recently been debating that. Uh, Bloomington has been discussing it. St. Paul right now is in the process of organizing their waste hauling collections as well. Yeah. It's something we weren't planning on taking on again, but uh, in recent surveys, residents are bringing up because a lot of residents of the city have paid a lot recently in street assessments to have their streets rebuilt, and they're like yeah. going, I don't want six garbage trucks going down my street yep. a week. But, yep. And organics collection is driving it too for us to have to look at Correct. it. So, Well, so now with today, with today being kind of the final day for things to be going through committee and then going on to the House floor, I guess, how does your role here change? Does it make things easier or more difficult for you to follow things? Well, today is, is what is called the second committee deadline and bills must be out of policy committees by the end of today or they are technically dead for the legislative session. And I say technically dead because ideas can come back as amendments to bills and that's one of the things we will now watch for is to make sure that ideas that were in a bill that may have died technically might come back as an amendment to another bill and so we spend a lot of time watching the floor sessions as they occur and making okay. sure that amendments, uh, unexpected amendments don't arise. Uh, so that, that will be the, the focus of our attention from now until May 21st when the legislature conven or adjourns. So do you actually spend time watching the House floor in action or are you kind of able to watch what's going on after the fact by watching online what's happened? A, a little of both. I okay. mean, the Senate meets at the same time frequently, not today, but oh. uh, frequently they'll be in session. Toward the end of the session, they'll both be in session at the same time. Okay. And so you have to watch the, the floor maybe from downstairs and try to be back and forth between the two bodies if there are 
pertinent bills up in each body. So uh, we will spend some time up here in the gallery if uh, there's a long debate and we want to hear what legislators are saying. More frequently we're on the second floor talking to legislators as they come out or pulling them out to express uh, support or opposition to amendments they're, they're debating. Mm -hmm. And that's one important fact I wanted to, to mention because I understand legally as a city we cannot hire lobbyists to lobby on our behalf. We rely on the League of Minnesota Cities to play that role. So that's really your role is you're basically lobbying these legislators and letting them know, hey, you know, cities in our that are in the metro here or wherever, whatever area we're talking about in a particular piece of legislation. Um, this yep. is how this is impacting them. Yeah, and uh, as creatures of the state, uh, as I said, we're impacted by a lot of the legislation. And frankly, legislators want to make sure they're not um, enacting a law that unnecessarily would trip up the city operations. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we do spend a lot of that time just communicating um, mm -hmm. either support for or opposition to an amendment based upon its impact on city operations. Mm -hmm. So, well, that's that's wonderful. I'm glad that we have someone out there <laughs> looking out for these things because it is just overwhelming when you look at the, the number of bills that are going through. Yeah. How about early in the process? I mean, when a bill's just being um, created, I mean, is the league get involved even before the session starts meeting with legislators or what happens then? Well, we have, we have our own set of issues that our city officials identify as, as priority issues for legislative change. And we have a policy committee process where city officials from across the state get together discuss emerging issues and then they give us direction as to what we will work on during the legislative okay. session. So we have our own proactive set of, of policy initiatives um, that may be election law issues. Uh, I've got several in the tax realm that I'm working on right now. Um, one related to uh, an exemption from the sales tax for city purchases through a contractor when we're redoing a road, when we're, mm -hmm. um, when we're building a public works garage. Right now, we don't automatically get the sales tax exemption that is due to local government because of rules that are in place in, in the state law. That's so, too bad because we're building a public works garage right yeah. now. <laughs> Well, and, and unfortunately, I mean, uh, if the city were to purchase all the materials on its own, you would not pay the 6.875% state sales tax on that. But if you use a contractor, mm -hmm. the contractor has to go through a rigorous process in order to, uh, to secure the exemption. And most cities just aren't willing to, to bother with the, okay. with the paperwork necessary. We're trying to simplify that law. We have uh, actually two sets of bills introduced that are in discussion right now at the state capitol to try to save taxpayers money so they're not paying property taxes to pay a state sales tax. And uh, unfortunately, that bill is going to be hard to get through the process mm -hmm. because it will take away state revenues because mm -hmm, our mm -hmm. cities and our counties aren't paying the state a sales tax. Mm -hmm. um, every legislator I've talked to agrees that it, it, it doesn't make any sense, but they have to find essentially about $17 million a year uh, to replace the money that cities and counties are otherwise paying right now to the state of Minnesota. And that is a, a heavy lift to get legislators to, to commit to that amount of financial mm -hmm. resources mm -hmm. being mm -hmm. redistributed. So, um, but anyway, we work on those proactive issues, but, but frequently during the session, there are, as I said, there are thousands of bills introduced. Many of those are not our initiatives. Many of those would require cities do more things. They might be mandates on what we do or how we do it. And okay. sometimes those mandates can be very costly for yes. taxpayers. Yes. And we, we regularly battle what we consider to be unnecessary, unfunded mandates that somebody wants us to do a report, wants us to do a process that may cost ultimately more money at the local level, and we try to watch those, and, and if something we feel is unnecessary or doesn't provide public benefit mm -hmm. um, that is commensurate with the cost, that we should oppose those. Mm -hmm. So we spend a lot of time doing defense work on issues that we feel aren't necessarily in the best interest of taxpayers. Right, and we do too. Right. Yeah, that, that's the, the big focus. That's Unfunded mandates is a popular term that we hear yes, yes. <laughs> in our department because there's a lot of things we do like that. Okay, well, that uh, thank you for yeah. uh, all the work you do and um, that the League of Minnesota Cities does. Uh, I think it's really um, helpful that uh, because we just can't be down here uh, testifying and right. watching these things all the time. So it's 
it's good that I think you folks let us know too when it is important that maybe we do come and testify in a particular hot yep. issue at the right time. And We frequently will yeah. bring in city officials where we feel, I mean, frankly, city officials are the best lobbyists that there can be. They're much better than I could ever be mm -hmm. because they can talk about this specific impact on the city and we frequently bring people in. One of the challenges is this process up here um, makes it very difficult for the average citizen to get involved. Um, and us as staff. <laughs> right. Committee hearings can be scheduled in the morning mm -hmm. and they don't get to a bill until the evening. In fact, I'm sure today there'll be several bills that were up at eight o'clock this morning that won't be debated until probably eight o'clock tonight. Right. And to ask somebody to come in and wait to testify mm -hmm. and spend mm -hmm. 12 or 14 hours of their day to do that mm -hmm. is, is, a, is a very big lift and we would yeah. uh, we, we do our best to bring our city officials in but frankly uh, the process isn't not very conducive to, to bringing the citizens in all the time. Yes, many of us so. on staff have endured yes. those miserable days waiting around and paying for parking by the hour while you're waiting for your turn yes. to testify so uh, sometimes it works out good and sometimes not. But. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for well, meeting with yes. me today and taking some time out and, and teaching yeah. us a little bit more about this interesting state legislative process. Thank you very much. Do you have a drawer full of broken electronics, rolls of ripped up carpet in your basement, or a broken washer in your garage? Well, the City of Fridley is hosting plenty more events this year for you to drop off items for recycling at free and reduced pricing. Join us at Green Lights Recycling at 1525 99th Lane, five miles up the road on May 12th, July 14th, September 8th, or November 10th from nine to noon to get rid of your items in an environmentally friendly way. All Fridley residents get a $15 off coupon at each event. Visit fridleymn.gov backslash drop off for coupons, pricing, and more, or call 763-572 3594. All events will also feature a paper shredding truck where you can securely shred paper for free. Well, I'm at the office of Representative Connie Bernardi, who is our House Representative for the City of Fridley. Thank you, Connie, for taking some time out today. I know it's a busy day for you, like everyone here today, but we wanted to sh tell people a little bit about the whole legislative process and being our representative we especially wanted to talk to you. Well I'm so glad you're here and I can't wait to uh, help to uh, communicate how to get involved at the Capitol and how all this stuff happens. Yeah you and I I don't know if you remember but I think I started working for the city of Fridley about the time you became a representative. Right in the early um, 2000s. Yeah I, I started uh, in 97. Okay. And we um, Connie, I don't know if people remember, but Connie was very uh, instrumental in getting a piece of legislation passed in regards to a project I was hired to, to work on, and that was restoring the wetlands at Springbrook Nature Center, um, because I was the environmental planner back then, oh. and that was part of, part of my role. But we were trying to get, for years, we'd applied several times to get uh, federal funding to restore the wetlands and uh, you helped us get funding for that project, which was um, quite incredible. Well, I know, I actually get goosebumps about it, and I was telling the kids, um, young people, they came down to a march, a march last uh, weekend, and we gave them behind the scene tours, a, a tour of the chambers, and told them some inside stories. And one of them mm -hmm. I shared was what you're exactly talking about. Oh. I was a freshman, and they had, um, there was a bill up for an environment bill, and I had an amendment to amend the bill, and I talked with the chair of it, and usually something like that never gets passed on the House floor. Never is a big word, but rarely. And I was a freshman in the minority. Mm. So that, like, r rarely happens. Mm -hmm. And so I did my bill, and I got, uh, uh, it was really close, the majority and the minority had close to the same amount of members, and I had enough Republicans join me to pass my amendment. And the, ga the gasp in the chambers, it was like, oh, people couldn't believe it. And yeah. I was so excited, and it was a really big accomplishment. Well, I don't know if people have heard of the retiring room, but you go back in the retiring room, and um, I was very excited about it. And then all of a sudden, I find out they're going to take a re-vote on this bill. So I... I thought they're going to kill my bill because oh. a freshman legislator, we mm -hmm. just can't have that happen. Mm -hmm. So they ended up taking a new vote on the bill, and we got over a hundred votes to pass that bill. 
And because people didn't want to take a bad environmental vote on clean water, oh. and I had drafted it in such a way that I could actually get support from people for mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. and so it ended up passing that amendment that helped fund mm -hmm. the Put more restoration into that program. Yeah. Right, and the cool thing about it is, is that Springbrook, as you mentioned, I mean, the stormwater runoff was like destroying the wetlands and the habitat, mm -hmm. and uh, it really needed to be restored, and mm -hmm. so. That was the first urban wetland restoration project in the country happened at Springbrook Nature Center. Wow. Yeah, so that was pretty yeah. cool. And then can I just say one more thing about Springbrook? So go forward a few years, and we ended up, I was a chief author of a bill to get $5 million for Springbrook oh, for to bonding. build a new building. And uh, we were able to get that passed. So that was, we don't always get a lot of bonding money in suburbs. Right. And so to get $5 million and it mm -hmm. leveraged over, I brought over $2 million locally by donations mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, fundraising mm -hmm. and stuff and partnerships. And so over $7 million was invested in Springbrook because it was being loved to death. Mm -hmm, we needed mm -hmm. to get a facility where it could manage the people going into the park and out of the park. Mm -hmm. And it's just such a mm -hmm. great asset for a yeah. community. Yeah. And just great examples of you know how working closely on the city mm -hmm. level with with you as our state representative um, mm -hmm. helps us get some of these things funded that mm -hmm. that we want to accomplish. Now I wanted to talk about committees a little bit because that's one of kind of the mysteries to me of this whole mm -hmm. process. Um, just knowing you know today's crunch day for things getting mm -hmm. through committee. So you're on three different legislative committees. Right. Do you get to select what committees you go on or is that decided for you? Well, what we do is we um, make suggestions on what we'd like to be on. And kind of a, the longer you've been here, the better chance you get okay. to be on the committees that you want to be on. And so I've, since I've been in the legislature, my focus has been a lot around education mm -hmm. as well as um, transportation. And uh, I'm serving on the Higher Education Committee this year and career readiness. So it's looking okay. at having people ready for careers, whether it's trade school or it's traditional college, and just making sure that we have a great workforce. And so actually that starts back in high school because now lots of high school students are taking college credit courses mm -hmm, in a mm -hmm. variety of different ways. Mm -hmm. And so I work with our local schools and trying to get money for that. And when kids do that, they end up, students do that, they end up being more successful at college. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the committees I'm on. And I've served on K-12 for, for many, many years. And mm -hmm. like right now, it's actually a pre-kindergarten bill. And, yeah, pre-kindergarten bill. And our school district, as well as Spring Lake Park that has students in it too, we have fun, we got funding from the legislature for a pre-kindergarten program, and that just for our school district. Just for our school okay. district. And there's about 59 school districts that receive this funding, and it's going to expire. And so I'm working on a bill to try to get that sunset, as we call it here, right. passed into permanent funding. Okay. And I'm working with the governor on that, and okay. hopefully, hopefully that'll make. A difference. So, okay. you know, all this, you know, I grew up in the community mm -hmm. and I absolutely love representing mm -hmm. the community in which I grew up. And so working with the school districts and uh, we have five school districts in our yeah. in our it's community. You're right. And they all have different needs. So I work really closely with them as well as the cities I represent. And so mm -hmm. Fridley, we have a very close partnership. Mm -hmm. So the chief of the fire department was down here that well the fire chief was down mm -hmm. here recently and um, there's an important bill that affects mm -hmm. Fridley the um, chief of police he called me last week or the mm -hmm. week before and told me about an important bill that mm -hmm. affects the city of Fridley mm -hmm. so I work really close partnership mm -hmm. with the mm -hmm. with the city right mm -hmm. yeah we probably should clarify that I know we we're talking a little bit uh, earlier with uh, someone from the League of Minnesota Cities about lobbying and how we rely on them but I probably should have clarified when we talked about that that we as city staff um, do communicate via email or phone calls to our legislators too to right. let you know when something's impacting us. So, right, it's really, it's yeah. super important. So sometimes it's like I create the bills, mm -hmm. like getting funding for Spring Break Nature Center restoration or getting $5 million for it. I'm mm -hmm. actually write the bills or the mm -hmm. chief authors and some of them, other things are happening to our community. Mm -hmm. And so it's important that everybody has the facts on how that affects people because right. that's what I'm about. It's like I bring this up in committee all the time. We were working on a transportation bill last last night and I was like, you know, we haven't talked about people yet. And mm -hmm, we need mm -hmm. to talk about how this bill is going to impact 
impact people to have affordable transportation options. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes people just think about the industry mm -hmm. or they think about the words on the paper or the concrete. They don't think about how these things affect people's lives and that's mm -hmm. what I tried to bring home at the legislatures. Mm -hmm. How is this going to affect someone's life? Right, right. Mm -hmm. Well, we appreciate all the work that, that you're doing on behalf of, of Fridley and, and uh, how you're so accessible to us to, to help us uh, contact you and let, let, uh, let you know what's, what's impacting us. So, um, and I appreciate your newsletter too. If you um, are interested, you can get Representative Bernardi's newsletter too to let you know what she's working on and what her passions are. Right. Um, throughout the session. So. And what I'd like to also add to that is to let people know who are tuning in is that you can contact me anytime. There's things that impact your own personal life, things that you care about that affect your neighbors, or things that you care about the state of Minnesota and the direction it's going. So you can call me directly, you can email me, you can send me a letter, and that's what I love doing the most in my legislative work is helping my constituents. So someone here who was a um, nurse, was here yesterday from the city of, Fr not from the city of Fridley, but from Fridley, who was a nurse practitioner. And so she came and shared her professional wisdom and what she sees. And that really helps me to represent people better when people come and visit me. I had the Deer Hunters Association here, which is had member of the city of that lives in Fridley. They were here a couple weeks ago. So I get all kinds of visitors. Mm -hmm. It's really, that's my favorite part mm -hmm. of my job. Mm -hmm. But must be very difficult when you've got all these hearings and appointments you have to keep throughout the day and be ready to head into session and then all of a sudden a visitor shows up at your door. So well, it, we do a lot of scheduling. So we'll mm -hmm. schedule an appointment okay. with somebody and um, they're really grateful for it and I'm grateful for it. And it's mm -hmm. my best part of best part mm -hmm. of my day. So it's okay. it's kind of morning until late at night. So right. I right. did get done at eight o'clock last night. So that was an earlier night for me lately. Wow. <laughs> wow. Well, good luck getting through that in thank the you. weeks ahead. And thank you for taking out time out to meet with us today. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, I'm Amy Kempf, Fridley's Neighborhood Preservation Specialist. And this is Codes to Know. In, after winter, it is very common for branches to fall in your yard. While property maintenance is important, don't forget to clean up after a project. City code prohibits the outdoor storage of brush piles. Only neatly stacked firewood in the side or rear yard is permitted. Remember that state law prohibits putting brush, tree, and yard waste in your garbage. Yard waste for the purposes of composting may not be stored in the yard in plastic or other types of bags according to City Code 113. If you choose to have your yard waste picked up by a hauler, please have it collected on the next collection day from your project. A list of licensed haulers can be found on the City of Fridley website by selecting Waste and Recycling in the Safety and Services drop-down box. Anoka County has a compost site nearby at the Bunker Hills site if you choose to drop off your yard waste for a minimal fee. For more information, feel free to contact me at 763-572-3598. Well, I'm now at the new Minnesota Senate building with Senator Carolyn Lane, our senator representing Fridley, um, to talk a little bit more about this legislative process from the Senate side, which is mm -hmm. a little bit different than the House side that we've talked about. So, Senator, I, um, I understand, um, I want to get a better handle because I know we just you just came from a caucus meeting, and I wanted to learn more about what that means and what's all involved in that. We're catching you kind of in between sessions yes, here. And I think we uh, have some confusion as to political caucus and the DFL caucus in the, in the legislatures. Mm -hmm. So, But at the, our level, we have a Republican caucus and a DFL caucus that meets privately to discuss things that are happening. And... Um, for our DFL caucus in the Senate, there's the minority leader, uh, Tom Bach, and then there's three assistant minority leaders, and I'm one of those. Um, so we just meet together and discuss issues and then take them to the larger caucus, and we have to know what's happening on the floor, what's happening in bills, what's happening in committees, so that we can know what to be alert on and mm -hmm. how we're gonna push back. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. bottom line for the legislature is who's ever in the majority the place is geared to make sure their will is done. Who's ever in the minority, the place is supposed to be geared so that their voice is heard. Okay. And there's the difference. So when you're in the majority, you get to get 
your agenda usually, depending on who the governor is, because sometimes you get things vetoed. Um, mm -hmm. But if you're in the minority, you really can't always make things happen. And sometimes these days you, you have a hard time making things happen. But your voice is supposed to be heard to point out the problems, to point out mm -hmm. different priorities, to point out values. Mm -hmm. So, And in our case, we do have governor to, to be, as he calls it, the goalie, the backstop mm -hmm. for bad th what we would, would consider bad things. Mm -hmm. Well, it's an interesting look at things because from a city perspective, as we're calling our legislators or emailing them and letting them know about things that are of concern to us, we have to keep in mind you are limited yes. and what you can do as a legislator when you are in the, in the minority. But I will give an example that's actually going to happen in the next hour. Um, city of New Brighton called me last night saying, oh, there's an amendment being added to the elections bill, which is Secretary of State Steve, Steve Simon's technical bill, which is not a big deal. It should be very easy. Um, but there's some amendments coming from Mary Kiffmeyer, and one of them affects New Brighton. They have many years now tried to get to even year election instead of odd year elections. Oh. And they now have done an ordinance to say we're doing this. And she has an amendment that came from certain people in New Brighton to stop it. And it will put a stop on this and, and, and make them go forth in two more odd year elections before they can have this process taken mm -hmm. care of the way mm -hmm. she, she did it. And so I, I talked to her last night and I'm objecting. The thing is that Governor Dayton has said all campaign and election related bills have to be bipartisan or I won't sign them. So if she adds this and if it stays, because it would have to go to a conference committee with the House because they don't have it in there, if it stays and comes to our floor for a vote before it goes to the governor for signing, um, we as a Democratic team would say, no, you're bringing politics into this clean bill and we're not going to vote for it. And then if she were to do that all the way, Governor Dayton would say, I'm not signing it. Mm -hmm. So we do have some backstop somewhere okay. <laughs> sometimes. And okay. in this particular case, uh, Secretary of State Steve, Steve Simons knows that this is happening and is able to say, fine, I can live without these technical changes for mm -hmm. another year if I need to. Uh, do what you need to do. Okay. So Mary Kipmeyer will know that and we'll see what she does. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, we've, in this whole show, we're kind of talking about the legislative process and how um, bills uh, come to fruition through the, through the state process. Um, I'm curious to know if there's some things you've been involved in where you've created something from, you know, brought, introduced a bill right from the very beginning and how that happened. It, it, are you hearing of issues um, from, I mean, I, the things I get involved in are things that have been introduced by people in industry mm -hmm. and something that the city's doing to regulate them. They don't like it and they're wanting to change it. Mm -hmm. But does that happen in your case that you get approached by There's, There's people? many. When you're, again, when you're in the majority, most of the bills will come to the majority because they okay. can get things done. So when you're in the majority, the state government, the health department, for instance, Department of HHS, all these different departments will come to a legislator to carry a bill that they think that they have some understanding of and interest in. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then with their help, you, you, you carry it through the process. Other times, um, somebody brings you something. For instance, Fridley Resident is pushing hard for the uh, hands-free cell phone bill okay. right now. And he, he was, that has not passed, and this time, the chair of the Judiciary Committee, a Republican chair, wasn't going to hear the bill at all. He was just, just stopping it. Um, and so what, he's, what this man is asking me is, what can I do to push on him? And I said, politely, because the chair doesn't like impoliteness, <laughs> politely make your point, call in, have people email, have people call, come in in present, you know, be there. And they, they masked it. Uh, they came and they uh, had like 50 people outside his office. They um, uh, followed him around in that, in that sense, outside of committee meetings and, um, and got the phone calls going and the emails call going and made a concerted effort so that he actually, a couple days ago, heard the bill. And then once you hear the bill, who cannot agree? for the mm -hmm. deaths that have just happened. Mm -hmm. The person mm -hmm. in Fridley, the latest death by the truck driver that was texting, the, the guy that was killed was a friend and a co-worker. Oh, okay. So he was pushing for this hands-free mm -hmm. cell phone mm -hmm. bill. And uh, it passed unanimously. So now I don't know how what its trajectory will be, but at mm -hmm. least it, it did have that, um, that step done, mm -hmm. which was necessary. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it can come from people, the different bills that you do want to get passed, or sometimes um, you have a personal interest, uh, maybe friends of yours. I actually, in 2010, removed embalming from the law 
Um, and that's a, another whole story of great interest to me <laughs> <laughs> because it allows families to have more care of their, of their, of their deceased after, after they've passed away. And, um, and instead of just having them swept away by a funeral director and then you have two hours in a funeral director home and, and that's it. But instead you could actually take more time and you don't have to be involved. Dr. Michael Osterholm, uh, world-renowned mm -hmm, epidemiologist, mm -hmm, backed mm -hmm. me, was here to testify in both the House and the Senate and backed me all the way. And we, we moved that. So it was unnecessary. There's a different reason that it was put in that way, um, which is a good reason, but sometimes there's unattended consequences. So we removed that. And now, since 2010, I've done over, well, 45 different presentations to various groups on this subject of after-death care by a family. Oh. And other interests that come out of that is green burials, because green burials, you don't want to be embalmed either. And it's a, it, it very much interest to baby boomers and, and millennials. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. there we have that. And that's a very different sort of bill, but it got a lot of media back then because it was different. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it came out of uh, personal interest. Interesting. Well, I love your examples of kind of giving people a, a feel for just how they can bring about change yeah, if they're interested in it. They can also at the start at the precinct caucus level, which mm -hmm. is, we use the word caucus a lot. We have caucuses here, just mm -hmm. groups of us together, mm -hmm. DFL and Republican, but in your local area, there's the precinct caucuses and they meet on a, a February, I think now on a Tuesday. And you can, you can go there, talk about issues and you can get on the list to be going to the local convention, which was held at Fridley High School okay. in um, March, I think. And, um, and then there, you can put in a resolution. And these resolutions, if they're passed at that level, go on to the state, in this case, DFL level. And those, those, um, those resolutions then become the platform, the DFL, and hence the easy to do bills off of that. Okay. Thank you for explaining that, because that has been the one mystery to me that people have said, well, it oftentimes really starts in your precinct caucus, and yeah. I didn't quite understand how that works. So, well, excellent. Well, I know you have a busy day. You have, you know, three different committees that you're yeah. on and um, have hearings you need to be part of. Yeah. So I really appreciate you taking time today yeah. and and uh, showing people and explaining how All some right. of this works. All so right. thank you. Thank you for your work. Thank you. <laughs> what type of bees are hard to understand? Mumblebees. <laughs> but seriously, did you know that there are over 3,500 different species of bees native to the United States? Bees, butterflies, and some species of birds and bats are an important type of animal called pollinators that are responsible for fertilizing flowers. One third of our food and drink depend on animal pollinators, as well as 75% of our flowering plants. Fridley was designated a pollinator-friendly community in 2018, which means that we are committed to protecting pollinators and their habitat. Over the next few years, we will be planting more pollinator-friendly species in our parks and decreasing pesticide use in these areas. Learn more about this initiative and what you can do at home at fridleymn.gov pollinator. Well, I hope this program has provided you some insight into the state legislative process, which is very different than the city process for a changing city code. Both processes can impact your life in Fridley, so I hope you have found the show as informative as I have. But the purpose of this program is to really clue you in on what are the latest development projects coming up and happening in Fridley. So I wanted to take a moment to just let you know some of the projects that have recently been approved at the city, and here are a few sites uh, that you're going to see some activity happening on if you haven't already. One of them is the third phase building for the Cielo Apartments project on University Avenue, just north of 57th Avenue. Uh, another location uh, that's gotten some approvals is the northeast corner of East River Road um, and 694. Um, you're going to be seeing two industrial buildings being built on that site. And then um, at 69th and University Avenue, on the uh, location of the old soccer fields, um, we're soon going to be seeing the construction of uh, a group of one-level living villas that will be built by Pulte Homes. Um, uh, a business that's expanding, uh, Brink Brothers, uh, which is on Central Avenue near Fireside Drive, is going to be doing a building expansion where they're going to be build, adding on to their building to the, to the north of their current location. 
And then another business that ex is expanding is public storage, which is located on 694 along the railroad tracks. Uh, public storage is going to be doing a building addition, and they're also going to be installing an electronic billboard at that location. And then, of course, the construction continues on the Civic Campus project. Uh, the uh, public works facility is soon to be completed, and uh, the other building closer to the uh, highway on University Avenue will be uh, going through continuous progress uh, as we plan to move into that uh, this fall. So I just, uh, with that, wanted to thank you for watching the Community De Development Journal and taking an interest in development in Fridley. This has been a production of Fridley Municipal Television, Channel 17. Thanks for watching.